what, what do we do with those pesky genealogies? Frustrating, boring, pointless, exhausting, confusing. Christians have used all those words to describe the genealogies in the Bible. Who doesn't get bogged down in reading the first nine chapters of First Chronicles? Or how many of us won't admit to skipping those nine chapters when we come to them in our Bible reading schedule? What good is a list of names that are hard to pronounce, most of whom we don't know anything about? Didn't Paul command us to avoid genealogies in Titus 3.9? But then it was also Paul who said in the famous words of 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All Scripture certainly includes all the genealogies recorded in Scripture. So the challenge for every Christian is to seek to discover how these genealogies are profitable. What do they teach us? Do they provide some reproof, some exposure of our false beliefs? Do they even somehow have some relevance for correcting our behavior? Could they even serve to train us in righteous living? How can a list of names accomplish any of that? How should we read these genealogies? The genealogies Paul wants us to avoid in Titus surely refers to genealogical speculation outside the Bible, which was incredibly popular in his day and distracting to the Christians he was writing to. Even to this day, Jewish people sometimes utilize genealogies to discredit Jesus as the Messiah. This morning we'll consider the first genealogy in Scripture, and it's a short one. With this genealogy, we can recognize certain features that can guide us in reading all of the genealogies. Genealogies can have multiple purposes. The brief genealogy Moses embedded in Genesis 4 serves at least three purposes. First, he uses this genealogy to move the story along through several generations of history. Along the way, he'll point out some advances in cultural development. Second, as there's an emphasis on the first father and the last father, we see the shadow of murder cast over the whole family line. Thus, as Paul recognized, we see the reign of queen sin, particularly on display. Third, this shadowy genealogy tracks the line of the offspring of the serpent. Nevertheless, in the shadows... God's grace shines through. And Moses immediately provides a contrast, reintroducing the line that will carry forward the offspring of the woman, giving the concluding passage of this section of Genesis a glimmer of hope. Sometimes, though we can't always be certain, the meanings of the names in a genealogy suggest something important. That may be the case here, so I'll draw our attention to the meaning of these Hebrew names. Also, the number of names or the number of generations in a given genealogy can be important. In Genesis 4, we see seven generations. And the number seven in the Bible often takes on symbolic significance, indicating completion or wholeness, which can be related to good or evil. Thus, number seven from Adam becomes important. And speaking of Adam, we should recognize that this genealogy actually began formally at the beginning of chapter 4. Moses chose to break into the genealogy and tell us the story of Cain murdering his brother Abel, which Pastor Ken helped us look at last week. Thus, we have a tight connection between Adam's first son and number 7 in this particular line of descent which foreshadows the next section of Genesis beginning in chapter 5 with another longer, much more detailed genealogy. We are coming to the conclusion this morning of the second section of Genesis, which began in chapter 2, verse 4, with the phrase, These are the generations of heaven and earth. Thus, chapters 2 through 4 have focused on the development of the relationship between the God who lives in heaven and the humans who live on earth. And things have not gone well. After the Creator's free and wondrous act of creating everything, including humanity, He deputized Adam and Eve as His vice-regents. They were commissioned to rule over the rest of creation. In chapter 3, one of their subjects, a crafty snake, empowered by an evil spiritual being, called God's words to them into question and led them into rebellion. 
The humans submitted to the serpent, believed his words, rejected God's words, and rebelled. The Lord pronounced judgment and sent Adam and Eve out of the delightful garden into the wild wilderness of the world. They were still commanded and empowered to be fruitful and multiply. But being fruitful, both in children and in fruit, and multiplying would prove to be more difficult than it would have been had they not rebelled. Nevertheless, through the pain, they produce two sons. But to add to the physical pain of childbirth, Eve particularly must bear the grief of one son murdering another. In his mercy... The Lord doesn't execute the murderer, but he is exiled from his family, cursed by God so that his farming would fail. And he's also commanded by God to live a life of nomadic wandering. We pick up Cain's story at this point. We find Cain, the city builder, in verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. It's reasonable to expect that Adam and Eve have continued being fruitful and multiplying, presumably producing daughters in the intervening years. Moses will speak of their having other sons and daughters besides the ones named in the narrative in chapter 5. Thus, we should see Cain marrying one of his sisters. If all humanity descends from a single pair of ancestors, then of course the sons and daughters would have to marry each other. As population expands, this kind of intimate relationship becomes both unnecessary and unwise and even potentially biologically harmful. And thus we see the Mosaic Law thousands of years later forbidding such relationships. But here at the dawn of history, there's nothing to criticize or question in marrying one's sibling. As we consider the larger question, however, I think it would be helpful for us to use our sanctified imaginations just a bit. Too many skeptics scoff at this narrative, saying that there's very little that makes sense about this story. We don't know how old the brothers were when Cain murdered Abel. It's reasonable to assume that they were, at bare minimum, young adults. That means perhaps at least two decades had passed since they were born, which would be plenty of time for Adam and Eve to have more children who had even grown up into young adulthood. But if Cain was sent away from Adam and Eve because of his murder of Abel, then where did he pick up his wife? A clue might be hiding in plain sight in the larger context. Flip back to Genesis 2. In Genesis 2.24... Moses inserts a comment that reflects the marriage practices of his own day, and he suggests that the reason for this practice is because of Adam and Eve's marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. When we looked at this verse, we discussed how typically the son would not literally leave his parents' home. Instead, he would fetch his wife and bring her into his father's house perhaps building an extension onto the home. Instead of a mother-in-law suite, think daughter-in-law suite. But sometimes they did literally leave. And this didn't just apply to sons. So using our imaginations, wouldn't it be reasonable to think that some of Adam and Eve's children might have left home in order to spread out, recognizing that they needed to start their own family units? Now, maybe we think they'd need to cluster together and strengthen their core family unit, more hands to work the farm, right? Maybe so. But what I know for sure is that when we get to Genesis 11, we're going to find people sticking together and not spreading out is not a good thing. And the Lord intervenes directly in order to get them moving. So perhaps it's quite reasonable to assume that some of Adam and Eve's daughters have left the nest Set out, set out away to the east, planted their own farms, set up their own homesteads, so that when Cain arrives in the land of Nod, Wonderland, he finds himself a sister who becomes his wife. The Lord had commanded Cain to wander, but he instead settles. But more than settling, we find him here building a city. Now, don't think a modern urban center like New York City when you read about cities in Genesis. 
especially at this early stage, we're talking about something much more modest. The Hebrew word itself merely communicates a permanent settlement. But the key feature is that such a settlement is generally protected with a wall or a tower or a fortress of some kind. Thus Cain is here rejecting the promise of God to protect him. The Lord had put a mark on Cain or given him a sign. The Lord had done something intended to protect Cain from any of his relatives seeking revenge for murdering Abel. Cain does not trust the Lord to protect him. So he builds a city to protect himself, to provide security for himself. Instead of wandering, he's settling. There is no sense in which Cain is remorseful or repentant. He remains in rebellion against God. Moses, in the book of Genesis, will draw comparisons and contrasts to Cain to Cain's city-building act, making it clear how condemnable Cain's act is. In chapters 10 and 11, Moses will highlight Nimrod, building Babel. But the bulk of the book of Genesis focuses on the patriarchs, who who were promised a land, but who continuously wander, never getting to settle in the promised land itself. The patriarchs don't build cities for themselves. In the New Testament, we're given some insight into the attitude that characterized Abraham. We're told that he wandered both in and out of the promised land. But what motivated Abraham, according to Hebrews 11.10, is that he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. No man-made city will do. Only a God-designed, God-built city can be the permanent home for God's people. Even Jerusalem was only a man-made city. God chose to make his name dwell there, but only so as to foreshadow the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the eternal Jerusalem, whose designer and builder is God. And we get a glimpse of some of its design in the final chapters of the Bible in glorious, visionary splendor. Cain's city, he named after his son, Enoch. Now, there's an oddity in English about the spelling of this name. The Hebrew is Hanok. I'm not sure where the H went in English, but in any case, it comes from a Hebrew word meaning to dedicate. It's related to the Hebrew Jewish holiday Hanukkah, which celebrates the rededication of the Jewish temple in about 164 B.C., But the idea of dedication has to do with getting something started, initiating something. Thus, Cain views his city as a new start for his family, a new start away from Yahweh. And he believes a new start that can perhaps overcome or avoid the judgment curse the Lord pronounced against him. He is continuing as the offspring of the serpent, believing he can determine what is good and what is evil for himself. The production of offspring gives him hope for the future, and he builds a city as a monument to his hope. But what hope is there apart from Yahweh, apart from the good creator? In verse 18, we see Cain's legacy, the core of the genealogy. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. Now, to see the full genealogy, we could recall verse 1. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of Yahweh. Then verse 17 resumes the genealogy, repeating the same verbiage. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And then verse 18 provides the rest of the list. When you count the fathers listed, you get a total of seven. Adam, Cain, Enoch, Irad, Mahujael, Methushael, and Lamech. Then, as we'll see momentarily, Lamech branches off with a mention of three sons and one daughter. So what is Cain's legacy? Well, the meanings of the names of these listed descendants might provide a clue. It's the context, however, that casts a shadow over Cain's line. He is offspring of the serpent, and so are his offspring. 
Some of these names have neutral or ambiguous meanings, but in this context, I think we should read them with a negative slant. As I mentioned a minute ago, Hanok, Enoch, means dedication or initiation, and it seems to refer to Cain's seeking a new start away from the presence of Yahweh. That's not good. Cain named his city after his son. Then Hanok, Enoch, names his son Irad. The Hebrew word translated city is ir, I-R. Thus, Irad essentially means city slicker or city boy. In this context, that's not a compliment. Irad names his son Mahujael. Now, before we talk about the meaning of his name, notice the last two letters, E-L. When you see L, L, as either the last two or the first two letters of someone's name in the Bible, many times you are looking at someone who's been given a name that refers to God. The Hebrew word El is perhaps the basic, most basic way of referring to God. And it is also a common way of referring to the highest God in polytheistic pantheons all over the ancient world. Now, having pointed that out, what does Mahujael mean? Well, it could mean God wipes out. Does this allude to some kind of disaster that the family experienced, which they then blamed God for? Maybe. The ambiguity of his name comes from the fact that the verbal part of the name could be viewed positively. Instead of God wipes out, as in destruction, it could mean God wipes clean. Again, context pushes us in a negative direction. In any case, Mahujael names his son Methushael. And this name also has ambiguity. The last two letters could be taken as before, referring to El, that is God. And if so, his name could mean God's man or man of God. Or it could mean more nefariously, the man who is God, expressing a hope that this son would become a god. But if the ending is actually Sha'el instead of just El, then we may have the idea man of Sha'ol, grave man, or undertaker might be the idea, associating the boy with death, perhaps unwittingly reflecting their existence as dead men walking since they live apart from the presence of the true God. In any case... The focus of the genealogy is on number seven, the climactic generation, Lamech. The meaning of this name may be simply warrior or conqueror, though there isn't much evidence to go on. Curiously, English spelling is pulled away from the Hebrew. The Hebrew would more precisely be put into English as Lamech, L-E-M-E-C-H. It has been suggested that his actions in taking two wives and setting down a policy of vengeance in his own case are the kinds of power plays common of ancient kings. Interestingly, we won't find the word king in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. This is very odd in contrast to other ancient literature, which, when talking about the earliest days of history, highlights the deeds of kings with great regularity and great propaganda. But, and this is only a speculative idea on my part, the Hebrew word for king is melech. And the Hebrew Bible does commonly make plays on words by switching letters around. So it's possible that Moses depicts this seventh man as a royal figure, but distorted, twisted, degraded. Remember, Adam was created as a king. Lamech has plummeted far from his ancestors' kingly status in the Garden of Eden. Lamech's perversions perpetuate an ugly legacy. Verses 19 to 22 provide some summary details. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Tzila. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Silla also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. 
Commentator John Carrad observes, the number seven is often used symbolically to indicate completeness and fulfillment. Indeed, the ever-increasing corruption and downright perversion of the human race reach a climax in the person of Lamech. In the genealogy of Genesis 5, we'll see a contrast with another seventh man from Adam through the line of Seth, another descendant of Adam named Hanoch, Enoch. But that one walks with God. The seventh from Adam through Cain's line distorts God's good design for marriage and escalates the violence of Cain. God's design and plan for human marriage is established in Genesis 1 and 2 and is easily summarized as one man married to one woman for life. Here we have Lamech deciding to marry two women. Presumably the objective would be to multiply faster. More offspring means greater prestige, more importance in the community. Multiple wives might enhance the reputed power and prowess of the man. While neither Moses nor the Lord explicitly condemns polygamy, the way Moses tells each story where multiple wives are involved, it's clear that these aren't examples of happy families. That God's design is for one man married to one woman for life will be reflected in the new creation following the global flood of judgment. The family that God preserves to begin a new humanity will be Noah and his one wife, Shem and his one wife, Ham and his one wife, and Japheth and his one wife. I've never seen an episode of the television show Sister Wives, but I've seen enough articles and memes on the internet taken from the drama of that reality TV show to know that the multiplication of wives in that man's life has predominantly led to the multiplication of sorrows, as it always does in the Bible. We are told the names of Lamech's two wives. That's interesting, given that we aren't told the name of Cain's wife. Ada means ornament. I like the way Jewish commentator Umberto Casuto explains this. He writes, A pretty little girl is born, the ornament of the family. So her parents call her Ada. The meaning of Zillah is harder to pin down, but it most likely comes from the root word that gives us symbols and the sounds that ring out from symbols in the Old Testament. Her descendants will be credited with developing musical instruments. Thus, the two women's names are associated with beautiful appearance and beautiful sound. With these two women, Lamech produced three sons and one daughter. The three sons have similar names, Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal, Cain. All three seem to be drawn from the Hebrew word for produce, as in what is brought forth from the ground. But in a secondary sense, each of them is shown to produce various cultural and technological advances. At least their descendants do. Jabal, mentioned first, is said to be the father or the originator of tent-dwelling livestock owners. This would be nomadic Bedouins. These are not city dwellers like Cain and his first couple of descendants. There is a return to wandering here. Jubal is said to be the father or originator of musicians, specifically those skilled in string instruments and wind instruments, Rudimentary harps and pipes are surely intended. Finally, note the name of Zillah's son, Tubal Cain. This son bears the name of his notorious ancestor, Cain. This may color the way we should view his achievement. He is said to be forger of bronze and iron implements. Moses doesn't specify weapons here, but I suspect weapons must be included. After all, it's relatively easy to beat a plowshare into a sword when the need or desire for violence arises. These cultural developments are good things that can be twisted for evil ends. This is the line of the offspring of the serpent, Cain's genealogy. Nevertheless, God's common grace is on display in these cultural developments. The building of tents will one day enable the building of a tabernacle in which God will dwell with his people. The herding of animals will provide sacrifices whose lives God will accept in the place of sinful people. Music will be used for the worship of the one true God. 
Bronze and iron will one day be used to build a temple for Yahweh. But none of this will benefit the offspring of the serpent. Cain's line is doomed. Zillah had a second child, a daughter named Naamah, but she is mentioned in passing, almost as an an extra add-on. Her name means lovely, but notice how she is referred to as Tubal Cain's sister rather than Zillah's daughter. She's named, unlike Cain's wife or any of the wives of the other men in the genealogy, besides Lamech. One wonders if she's only named to bring a certain symmetry or completion to the genealogy, not counting Lamech's wives, who aren't in the direct line of descent, between Cain and Naamah, we have ten names listed. Lamech's true legacy, however, is reflected in his song. His descendants and their cultural developments are significant, but they take a back seat here to the poetry of Lamech and what it reflects about his character and the nature of humanity at this point in history. This is the second occasion of recorded poetry in Scripture. The first was back in chapter 2, where Adam celebrated the excellence of his wife. Here, Lamech sings of his own violence, power, and right to vengeance. Look at verses 23 and 24. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. It's clear that the genealogy is highlighting a connection between Cain the murderer and Lamech the murderer. But linking two murderers by genealogy is incredibly ironic. Genealogies are all about the progress and continuance of life. This is the ultimate rebellion against the command to be fruitful and multiply. This rebellion is about taking life away. Genealogies record the advance of life, the addition of life, the multiplication of life. Murder takes life away. This is the original occasion of twisting the beauty of poetry and art to celebrate violence and sin. Much popular music today follows the inspiration of Lamech. Lamech was apparently wounded in a fight of some kind. What he describes is certainly not an occasion of self-defense, nor is it an occasion of things just getting out of hand. This is akin to extreme examples of road rage. Someone cuts a person off in traffic, so that person runs the other one off the road, pulls a gun, and kills them on the side of the road. The words translated wounding and striking will appear together again in the Mosaic Law in Exodus 21, 23 to 25, in the famous lex talionis, the law of retaliation, the broad expression of which is found in Leviticus 24, 19 and 20. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. The purpose of such laws was to prevent Lamech-like brutality. So here we have a second occasion of physical death. The second occasion of physical death recorded in Scripture. And again, like the first, it is the result of murder. Notice a difference, though. When Cain killed Abel, God showed up to interrogate and confront him. There is no mention of God at all here. We should take note of the Lord's absence. Lamech murders this young fellow as an overreaction to being slapped or poked or punched or shoved. This would have been one of his relatives, a young cousin or nephew perhaps. He boasts of his violence, his murder, And he boasts to his wives. Why does he do this? Consider the possibility that this young man he's murdered was one of Ada's nephews or one of Zillah's cousins, someone in their family. If so, Lamech threatens his wives in case they should get any ideas about pursuing family justice against him. He might be saying, basically, look, I murdered him just because he injured me. If either of you come after me, I'll do far worse to you. K 
Cain's revenge, as he calls it, was actually God's pronouncement of protection for Cain. Here, Lamech is essentially claiming the right to defend himself against any attempt at executing justice against him for his violence. It's no wonder that one author characterizes Lamech as a man of titanic arrogance and heartless cruelty. This climactic seventh man from Adam, through Cain's line, sets the stage for and gives us a glimpse of the way the world will be characterized in the days of Noah. In Genesis 6.11, Moses describes the people of earth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Lamech was no isolated evildoer. His ways became both common and dominant. It's amazing that the Lord had to flood the earth in order to execute judgment against all people. It's a testimony of God's restraining human evil in humanity that humanity didn't wipe itself out, murdering each other left and right in those days. In chapter 4, however, at the conclusion of this section of Genesis, Moses doesn't leave us on a depressing note. Instead, he turns to the offspring of the woman. In contrast to Cain's line tracking the offspring of the serpent, God also graciously continued the line of the offspring of the woman with the birth of Seth. Look at verses 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of Yahweh. Now, we probably shouldn't envision this as chronologically following the birth of the seven generations of Cain's line. In chapter 5, Moses will specify that Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born. Undoubtedly, Following Abel's murder, after Cain had been sent away from the family, Adam and Eve continue having children, and at some point, God grants them other male offspring. But it's this one that Moses tells about. It's this one that Eve seems to express her faith again that the Lord might be fulfilling His promise from Genesis 3.15. We could catch the word play Eve employs in naming her new son by translating her words, God has set for me another offspring. God set Seth in Eve's womb. Recognize Eve's faith here. She acknowledges God's gifting her with another offspring. That she uses the word offspring certainly suggests that she's recalling the promise of a single male offspring that would strike the head of the serpent and the spiritual entity that empowered it, she believes the proto-evangelium, the first announcement of the gospel. But her words also explicitly mention Cain's murder of Abel. We can appreciate Eve as a grieving mother here. It's possible that this is why she refers to God as Elohim. Whereas when Cain was born, she used the Lord's covenantal personal name, Yahweh. Here, she uses the simple Elohim, the title that highlights God's divine creative power, but doesn't necessarily reflect the intimacy of personal relationship. In her grief, she expresses her faith, her recognition that God has indeed given her a gift, that he is indeed fulfilling his promise, or at least moving toward fulfilling his promise. But at the same time, she feels some distance from her creator. Can you relate? What Christian mother who has lost a child, whether in the womb or as an adult, hasn't felt distant from God in the face of such loss? Eve mourns, but her grief is tempered by faith. So can it be for us. We rightly mourn the losses of life, and we may find ourselves lamenting, crying out to God who seems distant. We could appreciate if Eve wondered why God would allow one son to murder the other. 
Nevertheless, let's follow Eve's example of faith as well and cling, however loosely, perhaps by the edges of our fingernails, to the promises of God in Scripture. In verse 26, it seems like we might be getting our second genealogy already, but Moses is just foreshadowing the next section. One writer compared it to a trailer for the sequel. The offspring of the woman has offspring. God set Seth in place of Abel, and then Seth produces a son and names him Enosh. The Hebrew name Enosh is essentially a synonym for Adam. It is another common word for humanity. Some have suggested that it emphasizes the weakness and frailty of humanity. That would be appropriate here. Abel's name referred to vanity, brevity, emptiness. And so his replacement carries a name that highlights humanity's weakness and relative insignificance. We'll expand on the line of Seth next Sunday in chapter 5. But the final line of chapter 4 is so very important. Cain's genealogy had featured the development of culture and the advancement of technology. They built cities, they developed aspects of civilization, and they made music and art, tools and weapons. But Seth's line features worship of Yahweh. In Cain's genealogy, we've highlighted the importance of names, but it's the last name of the chapter that is most important the name of Yahweh. At the end of the last section, back in verse 16, we see Cain leaving the presence of Yahweh. And through Cain's lineage, we hear nothing from the Lord. Even when Cain's sin is repeated and escalated by Lamech, the Lord seems silent and distant. The name Yahweh appears ten times in chapter 4, but nine of them are confined to the first 16 verses of the chapter. The final climactic word of the chapter is the name Yahweh. And it is probably no accident that this is the 70th reference to God in Genesis, with 35 in the first section and 35 in the second section. It would be among Seth's line that the offspring of the woman would be counted, and it would be among Seth's line that Yahweh's name would be known, celebrated, and invoked. But what does this phrase mean? What does it mean to call upon the name Of Yahweh. Oftentimes it is assumed that the phrase describes prayer. Certainly the word call by itself is often used to describe the act of praying in the sense of calling out or crying out to God. However, calling upon the name seems to have a bigger idea in view. The summary of commentator John Walton is helpful. He writes, people call on the name of the Lord when they worship him at an altar or any other sacred spot. They call on the name of the Lord for deliverance. Calling on His name involves proclaiming His reputation and attributes. It is equated to taking hold of Him, aligning with His cause, and acknowledging Him as one's God. In other words, to call on the name of Yahweh is to claim Yahweh as your God. For us, Christians, it is equivalent to confessing with one's mouth that Jesus is Lord as an expression of believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, to borrow Paul's words from Romans 10, 9. Now at this point, I need to address a skeptic's argument that this verse presents a problematic contradiction within Scripture. Rather famously, the Lord said to Moses in Exodus 6, 3, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. To further illustrate the problem, I scanned through Genesis last week, looking for all the occasions where characters in the story either spoke the name of Yahweh or heard the name of Yahweh, and I counted 44 different passages, including the verse here in Genesis 4. And most of them were spoken by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or it was the Lord himself speaking to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what does the Lord mean by telling Moses that he didn't make himself known by his name, Yahweh? 
Clearly, the patriarchs knew and used the name Yahweh repeatedly. Well, I think the simplest, most straightforward explanation is that Yahweh never explained the meaning and significance of his name to the patriarchs. As an analogy, consider my daughter. Most of you know her name is Eliana. But I suspect very few of you know that her name is a Hebrew name. And it, is a very, it has a very particular meaning. And even few of, her, of you probably know the story of why I gave her that name. Her name is spelled E-L-I-A-N-A. Notice the L, A-L, E-L on the front. That is a reference to God, as we saw on the end of the two names earlier in Cain's genealogy. The letter I in the middle of her name reflects the Hebrew first-person singular possessive pronoun. You can recognize this from Jesus' famous cry on the cross, which is given in Aramaic in the Gospels as Eli, Eli, lama samachtani. The translation into English is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, Eli means my God. Ana, then, is the Hebrew verb meaning he answers. Thus, the meaning of Eliana's name is my God answers. The story behind that name, in short form, is that Tamara and I lost the first child we conceived. Until that unexpected conception, I did not want children. At all. But with the pregnancy that we only knew about for a week before the baby died in Tamara's womb, happened to be the week of our wedding anniversary, the Lord changed my heart, stirring a deep desire for a child. And so at that point, I began joining Tamara in praying for a child. My God answered. So, for the patriarchs, they called their God Yahweh, but he did not reveal to them the meaning and significance of his name. Likewise, for Adam and Eve, Seth and Enosh, and any others in their family who worshipped God with his personal name, Yahweh, they didn't understand that he was the self-existent I Am the God who was merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. I just quoted the words of Exodus 34, 6 and 7, which is the Lord's elaboration of his name to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, now it's true. All who worship Yahweh do indeed get to know Him that way because these character qualities reflect who He is. But Moses and the Israelites got that spelled out for them in a way the patriarchs did not and all who came before the patriarchs as well. That, I believe, is what Exodus 6, 3 means. And it certainly presents no contradiction to the beginning of calling on Yahweh's name among Adam's family generations before. The genealogy of Genesis 5 will bridge the generations from Adam to Noah and his sons. And then in Genesis 11, we'll have a genealogy that bridges the generations from Noah to Abram. And Abram will be the next person who is explicitly referred to as calling on the name of Yahweh in Genesis 12. The line of Seth does carry forward the line of the offspring of the woman, but that doesn't mean that we should assume every person listed in the genealogy counted as offspring of the woman. As we observed a few weeks ago, offspring of the serpent are often found among the offspring of the woman. As we'll see next week, though Seth's genealogy carries forward the offspring of the woman... As the Apostle Paul observed from his reading of Genesis, King Death reigned over even this lineage. And that indicates that Queen Sin was ruling as well. 
all are sinners, whether offspring of the serpent or offspring of the woman. That is why the Hanok, the Enoch of Seth's line stands out, as we'll see next week. The final lines of the second section of Genesis echoes the hope promised in the Proto-Evangelium of Genesis 3.15. And the announcement of people calling on Yahweh's name shines brightly as a word of hope in the shadow of murder. Cain's line is characterized by murder at the beginning and the end. Lamech's celebration of violence doesn't bode well for humanity. But the birth of Enosh foreshadows the coming of a new humanity, weak and frail though it be. And as Yahweh is the last word, punctuating this section of Genesis with a divine exclamation point, so his name is supreme and definitive over the destiny of humanity. The names of a genealogy can get us bogged down, but in Genesis 4, it's the last name that matters most. The name that stands outside of and above the human lineage. The name above all names is Yahweh. Calling on His name results in salvation. The prophet Joel, Joel spelled this out explicitly. But Paul quotes his words just a few verses after Romans 10.9. In Romans 10, 13, we read Paul quoting Joel 2.32. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Joel, the name is Yahweh. In Paul, the name is Jesus. Because Jesus is Yahweh. Romans 10, 9 again says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... Jesus is Yahweh. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is what Joel 2.32 was pointing toward. Now, of course, Joel's original audience didn't know the name Jesus, and they didn't know that the salvation that was being promised went so far as eternal life in union with the Messiah. But Joel's original audience did know that they needed to be saved from God's own wrath, God's own judgment. That was the danger that Joel's prophecy emphasized. They needed to be saved from God's wrath. So do you, and so do I. The reason calling upon the name of Jesus, confessing, acknowledging Him as Lord, as Yahweh, as the divine Savior, results in salvation is because Jesus has accomplished what was necessary to save sinners from God's wrath. Paul makes this clear in Romans 5, 8 and 9. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Jesus died in the place of sinners. Jesus suffered the abandonment of God on the cross. Jesus was condemned as a criminal, exiled from God's presence even, because He paid the death penalty that sinners owe. Sinners who trust in Him go free. No more debt. No more condemnation. No more expectation of wrath. Our hope comes in the shadow of the murder of the Messiah. Jesus rose from the dead, securing the divine judge's verdict of righteous for sinners who trust in Him, who believe in their hearts that God raised Him from the dead. Because He was obedient to His Father, who is the divine judge. Remember, the divine judge sent Jesus, sent His Son to accomplish all this for guilty sinners. Because Jesus obeyed all the way to dying on the cross, Paul says in Philippians 2, 9-11, Therefore, God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. It's true 
that Jesus always rightly carries the name, the Lord, the name of Yahweh. He is and always was and always will be Yahweh. However, God's exaltation of the man, Jesus, in light of his obedient death and victorious resurrection, indicates the wonder of a man being rightly identified as this uniquely divine name. And it points to the universal acknowledgement of this as his proper name. Though every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, this does not mean that every person will be saved. Every person who remains in their sin, every person who remains under God's condemnation, every person who refuses to bow to Jesus during their lives will know the truth after death. They may hate that truth but they will know it and they will acknowledge it. You, whoever you are, will bow to Jesus for eternity. Believe now that God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess openly now that Jesus is Lord that Jesus is Yahweh, that Jesus is truly God, truly man, and you will enjoy bowing to him for eternity. Refuse, and you will still bow, but you won't enjoy it. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Acknowledge his true lordship over your life, and find your place among the offspring of the woman, the serpent, has been defeated. His head has been crushed at the cross of Christ. Follow him no more. Would you pray with me? Father, we admit our frailty and our weakness. Indeed, we chalk it up to our frailty and weakness that we struggle so much in reading your word. These parts are difficult for us distant from our own culture, distant from our own language even. The barriers are many. And yet, you have put your Spirit in us as a guide to help us understand the truth that you've given to us in your Word. So help us to strive evermore to hear you clearly, even in these obscure passages that seem to be so unrelated to our lives. Help us to come with an attitude of desire, an expectation that there's something here that we've missed or that we're not able to see yet, but that you will show us in due course. Help us to keep looking and to keep reading, for it's here in the Scriptures where we learn of our salvation, where we learn of our Savior, where we see what He's done to rescue us from our plight. We don't need the eyes of the Spirit to see our plight. We suffer from it. We see it around us. We have only to look in the mirror, and we know that we're broken, and there's something wrong with the world. Help us, we pray. Help us keep turning to our Savior, even in the moments of deepest grief, deepest loss. Help us to cry out to you in faith, shaky as it is, mixed with unbelief as it so often is. Build our faith. Grow our faith. Teach us to trust your word. Help us to see your faithfulness on display in the stories of Scripture. And help us to believe that you're going to come through for us too. It might not look like we imagine, but we can be assured that in the end, it will be better than we could have imagined. So fill us up with hope, no matter the darkness that shades our lives. Fill us up with hope. Help us to keep looking at Jesus so that we can have the lights turned on and keep walking forward by faith, moment by moment and day by day. You are a great God. You are a good God. And you care for us so very well. Help us to see our lives that way 
Help us to bring the lenses of these truths to bear on how we live our day-to-day -day lives. And help us to understand the grace that you've given to us and the grace that you promised to us for the future. We celebrate these things. We rejoice in them. And we pray to be strengthened by them. For Jesus' sake. Amen.